Great. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, DBI 336. My name is Alex Josh, and I'm an architect in the Microsoft Business Unit at NetApp. And my name is Robert Quimby, and I'm also an architect uh, focusing on Exchange in the MSPU. So uh, today we're going to talk about some of the foundational technologies for data center operations. Uh, we're going to kind of do a little tag team here with me and Quimby. I'm going to talk more about uh, virtualization and Hyper-V and provisioning and things like that in that sense. And then we're going to shift gears a little bit of taking an example of an app that you could run on top of that infrastructure, um, in this case, Exchange. So hopefully we'll kind of give you an overview of how these technologies uh, intertwine, how they're similar, how you would then provision applications against this baseline. Um, obviously, we're happy to chat about uh, other topics as, after the session, but uh, we're going to try to stay focused on, on Hyper-V and Exchange right now. So from a, from a NetApp perspective, our goal really is to be the best platform for Microsoft applications, full stop. Whether that's virtualized or bare metal, uh, whether you're talking Hyper-V or other hypervisors we won't talk about. Um, so we are extremely focused on this. Um, we have a whole set of tools um, to support this. And in fact, just this week, we announced our uh, Fast Track Hyper-V solution that we developed in concert with uh, Cisco and Microsoft. So this is a huge area of focus for us. And what you're going to see is that we have a very layered design. Um, the Microsoft stack is very deep and it's very powerful, which is great. Um, it can be a bit complex at times. So one of the things you're, you're going to find is as you're moving into these virtualized environments or perhaps moving up into more cloud-style architectures, there's a lot of different management components and parts and pieces that you might choose to implement. Now, some of you have already deployed, say, uh, SCOM, and some of you have already deployed SEVMM, or maybe you've done all these things all together. So what we found is that every customer is at a slightly different point in that journey um, towards virtualization and perhaps cloud and other things. So our goal is to be extremely modular in our approach. If you decide to use SCOM for management, we have a SCOM management pack. If you decide to use Opalus, we have an Opalus integration pack. If you're a PowerShell guy, we have a PowerShell pack. You can see where I'm going here, right? Just keep going. So each one of those pieces you have in your environment, we can integrate, or we can create this more of a kind of meta in integration with tools like Opalus, where all the pieces are combined. So it's really going to depend on what's going on in your enterprise. In a private cloud uh, setting specifically, we have um, a very tight integration all up and down this, this layer cake. So all the way at the top, you've got reference architectures like FastTrack, right? So these are sample architectures. And in fact, in the case of FastTrack, it's actually a product, right? It's a bomb. You can go buy it, and it comes in a big-ass rack, basically, mm -hmm. and turn it on, and you, and you have private cloud. Underneath that, you have Opala Server, which is Microsoft's orchestration platform, and we have a very tight integration there. In fact, we just announced on Monday uh, that we're going to be shipping a, a native Opalus integration pack. Mm -hmm. Um, that's part of our on-command suite of software. Um, below that, you have system, cent system centers, other components like System Center Operations Manager. So for SCOM, we've had a management pack for SCOM for some time. Uh, if you're a SCOM user and you want to receive alerts through SCOM, once you, once you install our management pack, if something happens to your SAN, like you lose a fan or a drive dies or something like that, that alert will propagate up through, the, through our software across into SCOM and show up on the SCOM alert console. Uh, we have the Windows PowerShell Toolkit. This is something we actually announced not this year, but last year at MMS. And a lot of Windows administrators are using this tool. Basically, what it allows you to do is all functions that you can do for the management UI in uh, NetApp can be done from a PowerShell console. So for example, if you're an Exchange guy, like Q here, Definitely. that's a huge deal. Huge right? deal. Um, if, uh, you know, if you're not a PowerShell person, no big deal. There's GUI counterparts for all these things. The message here is that it's, it's about flexibility. It's about choice. It's about making sure we integrate with the way you do business as, as a Windows administrator, as a Microsoft Exchange administrator, as a SharePoint administrator, right? We don't want to teach you how to be a SAN person. We want to take that complexity away and just let you do your job, which is providing service to your end customers. Then underneath that, of course, you have our traditional products like SnapDrive. So SnapDrive is our Windows client software, allows you to do things like mount alone or take a backup and all the traditional things you'd expect a SAN to be able to do. It's all in an MMC snap-in and it runs right in Windows. And then on the bottom there, you see Data on Tap. So that's our, actually our core product. Data on Tap is the operating system that all of our controllers run. So right now, the current version of Data on Tap is 8.0.1. Um, and uh, that product has actually been around for quite a while. It's a very mature product. Um, so uh, a lot of stability there. So what we, we, what we thought we'd talk about is, <clears throat> uh, as an example of how this infrastructure can be used to simplify your implementations, is the rapid provisioning case. So it turns out that provisioning 
uh, from a storage perspective, can be one of the more painful experiences that a Windows administrator will ever have to go through, um, besides that 3 a.m. call that your server's down. Other than that, it's probably one of the more painful experiences. And the reason is because it's very common to have multiple teams involved. Mm -hmm. Right, so you have the Windows team who owns the cluster, let's say, and then you may have an Exchange guy who owns the Exchange server that runs on the cluster, and then you probably have a networking guy who owns the VLAN provisioning. And am I getting nods? Is this sounding familiar? Yeah, okay. And so the and virtualization then, guy. Then you got the virtualization <laughs> dude, right? And then you know you have the the mistress of the storage, and you know all these people involved. So this is a pretty routine action, right? It's very common to say, hey, my server's out of storage, or I'm bringing a new server online. I want some storage, and it's pretty um, it's pretty predictable. Right? I know that if a Windows administrator asks for a one terabyte LUN, I pretty much know how that's going to go down. Right? We're going to create a, a, a volume of a certain size. We're going to present the LUN. We're going to add the right iGroups and iSCSI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very predictable set of steps. It, it's complicated. It's predictable. It's repeatable. And therefore, it's a prime candidate for automation. Um, we have done this in a couple of different ways. Uh, we have uh, built a toolkit for Opalis that allows you to do this within Opalis workflow. I'm not actually going to show you that right now because I'm, I'm going to show that in the next session, the Opalis uh, session run by Adam Hall downstairs in about an hour. So if you're interested in that, follow me downstairs and we can see that. What we're going to show right now in a few minutes is the PowerShell version of this. Right? Some of my customers say, hey, I love Opalis. Opalis is fantastic. And some people say, you know what, that's a little bit heavy duty for me. I'd just rather do the whole thing in PowerShell. So, OK, no problem. We can do it either way. So that's what we're going to show in a minute. Uh, just a couple comments about provisioning before we get started. It can be a little confusing because there's multiple ways to do virtual machine uh, provisioning within the Microsoft stack. So last year, Microsoft came out with something they call uh, a nice long name. It's SCVMM SSP 2.0. It's a nice <laughs> acronym. So that stands for System Center Virtual Machine Manager, Self Service Portal 2.0. And what that allows end customers to do is to provision their own VMs from a web UI. Mm -hmm. So we support that, and we supported that when it shipped. That's not what I'm going to show you right now. <laughs> the other option is to write scripts and to automate it through Opalis or PowerShell. And that is what I'm going to show you. So I just wanted to, to, to put a caveat out there that if you're interested in doing the self-service portal, that is something we support. I'm just not going to show it to you. If you're interested, we can take you offline. We can show you that in another setting. Either way. We still go through the same ONTAP steps. The back-end storage component is exactly the same. Um, so on, I mentioned on-command a, a few seconds ago. So if you're a, a NetApp customer, how many of you folks are NetApp customers currently? Most of you? Awesome. So if you're a NetApp customer, you may be familiar with a product called Appliance Watch Pro, for, which is our System Center plugin product. Appliance Watch Pro 2.1 is the current version. On-command is the replacement for that product. So think of it as Appliance Watch Pro 3.0. We have a new name because we're aligning ourselves to the rest of our management products. On command is the new name for all management products at NetApp. Uh, we still have the SCOM management pack in there, which we shipped, have shipped for some time. It's, it's improved, and there's some new features in it. Um, we still have SCVMM Pro Tips in there, which we had in the old version. Again, new and improved. We still have SCVMM support for SSP. Uh, what's new in there is the new rapid provisioning commandlets, which are PowerShell commandlets, which I'm just about to show you. Um, we now support natively CSVs, which I'm also just about to show you. Um, and now we have the Opalis plugin, and that's what I'm going to show in Adam Hall's session downstairs. That's going to go into beta. Well, we're getting a little, we're almost running out of May here. Towards the end of May, perhaps right at the beginning of June, so a couple of weeks, we're very close to beta on that. And then we'll be shipping in the summer time frame, so July or August. So that software is pretty new. We also have this software running in our booth on the show floor. So if you swing by our booth, booth 1001, uh, right, Joan? It's 1001. Yep, 1001. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, it's 1001, and we can give you a hands on, and we can play with it if you want to see it. Um, on command has a pretty unique um, architecture. It's a service based architecture with a web services uh, layer built into it. And the reason why that's done is to allow us to do remote uh, management of storage on a Windows machine. So, on our old, our old product, the restriction was is that you could do pretty much anything you wanted, but you had to do it on the local machine. You had to actually log into the this Windows server to do the provisioning. And that's you know, OK if you have three or four Windows machines. But what happens if you have three or 400? Right? You probably don't want to log into each one in turn. Um, so what we can do now is we run a service on the target machine, and then we remote call that with a, with a web service API, and then tell it to, to take the storage action. So that way, you can manage you know, a dozen or 100 Windows hosts from one management workstation. Now, 
that could be you know, a Palace workstation triggering it through an action server, or it could be you know, PowerShell or whatever you choose to use. Uh, Sublun cloning is the feature uh, that we're, um, we're taking advantage of. So Data on Tap has had the, the ability to do Sublun cloning for some time, but getting to it as a Windows guy was very difficult. Um, it, was, it was very heavily used in our NFS support um, for doing cloning of uh, VMDKs, but we really couldn't do it in the, in the, in the Hyper-V world because we didn't support running CSVs in the past. So this Sublun cloning is not actually a new feature, but it's now uh, more interesting to us Windows guys um, than it was in the last version. So what it allows us to do is to take a running CSV, right, a cluster chair volume that's in a active Windows cluster that has Hyper-V VMs on it, take a gold master VHD file, so say you have a sysprepped file, clone that file, not copy it, but clone it, so that we're using the same bits on disk. Windows perceives that we just created a new file, but on the back end, all we're doing is we're simply cloning and reusing the same blocks. So it's extremely fast, and it's very space efficient. I can make 100 clones of the same VHD. I haven't used up one single byte of storage on the back end, because I'm just reusing the same blocks over and over and over again. Now, as you bring the VMs online, and you start writing data into those VHD files, the clones, the children, will start to diverge from the parent over time, right? And that's fine. As, but that way, you're actually storing only the unique data in the VHD and not the repeated data, like, for example, Windows itself. So this is a, an example of how it would work. So let's say you have a, a CSV, volume one, and in that CSV, you have a master file called 2KAR2SP1. What we do is we make a call against the Windows storage stack, and we say, what is the range of blocks on disk that this file represents, right? And what we get back in turn in the answer is an array, an array of blocks. Because really, if you think about it, what a file really is, is simply an array of blocks on disk. So now we have an array that says, this is the contents of this file. Then what we do is we create a new file. Let's call it clone.vhd. We didn't actually put anything in there. We just created the file. It's empty. But that file has that same property. It has this, an array of bytes on disk, a different array of bytes on disk. Well, guess what? Now we have a source and a target. So all we have to do is tell the SAN, make them the same, right? And we call this feature uh, flex clone for files. It allows us to clone an array of blocks from, from source A to target B. So as far as Windows is concerned, this file just magically appeared and is fully populated with the, with the source. Under the covers, what the SAN is doing is it's building reference pointers so that the new blocks simply refer, the inode simply refers to the old ones on disk. So very extremely space efficient, i.e. zero, which is about as efficient as you can get, and also very, very quick on the order of 30 seconds. Okay, there I my clicker. So once we have this blight arranged, we call the sysclone is Zappy, right? So Zappy is our API, and then, the, and then the filer under the covers makes the two block ranges the same, and now you have a running machine. So this is how you would set this up in Opalis, and this is the demonstration that I'm gonna give in the next session. So let's see how we do this in, uh, in PowerShell. Oh, Charlie. If I can push the right button, that would be lovely, huh? All right, so um, here we have a recording of a, of a PowerShell session. And what we're doing here is we wrote a script that takes a master file, clones it five times, and put it into a CSV and creates uh, uh, VMs in there. So what we see is we have a, a couple of, of, uh, of storage objects. We create a new disk using our API, disk O. We mount it to the Windows machine, and then we start cloning, right? And you'll start seeing these files appear. And actually, we're gonna, um, we're gonna zoom ahead a little bit, so we're not gonna watch this entire operation. That's why we're on a video, so we can compress it. This whole operation takes about 12 minutes, which we don't have enough time to show you here. So we're gonna compress that together. But what's happening is, is that we're gonna go through and we're gonna take a single file and we're gonna clone it five times, right? Exactly the same thing. And that's what you're seeing in here. So we take all those files, we clone it five times, and then we take that disk and we present it to the server as a new CSV, and then we create VMs pointing to those clone files. Um, and in the, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen there, you actually see the script running. And what you'll see is, is, I'm, is I'm outputting the amount of seconds that it's taking to clone the files. And because this is a pre-release version of the software, it's taking about 60 to, 60 to 70 seconds to clone each file. Now this is a 133 gigabyte fixed VHD that's been sysprepped. 
So it's pretty fast. The production version, we're shooting for around 30 seconds for this transaction. So by the time we ship, it'll be a little faster than this. Um, the other thing to note is that um, fixed VHDs are recommended, in fact, uh, strongly recommended by Microsoft definitely. for use in production, right? What they'll tell you is you really shouldn't use dynamic VHDs in production for performance, performance reasons. Performance, definitely. Right. But traditionally, most people use dynamic VHDs just because fixed VHDs are so difficult to work with, right? If you want to provision a new VM, you've got to copy the file and it takes forever. So this way you get the benefits of a fixed size VHD with the ease and flexibility of a dynamic one, right? So now you kind of get your cake and eating it too kind of deal. So now what you see is we've run a series of these, and over on the left-hand side, you see that one took uh, 68 seconds, and the next one took 66 seconds, right? So just kind of give you a flavor. Even though I'm zooming ahead in the video, you can still see the report out on the left side of what's going on. So what we're doing is we're filling up this drive, this drive O. We're filling it up with VHDs, boom, 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 one at a time. And then when that's done, in a couple of seconds, um, we're going to disconnect the disk, and that's what it's doing right now, from the local host. And the reason why we're doing that is because we're going to present it to the cluster, right? And you can't have it mounted as a local disk if you want to present it to the cluster. So we're going to present it to the cluster, and we're going to, um, we're going to mount it as a CSV. While we're doing that, look at, if you take a look at the code here, you'll see that the actual clone operation is one line of code. So this, this line right here, it says clone file, source, and destination. That one PowerShell command is what we use to clone the file. It's extremely simple. Clone file, source, destination, go. And then, then it takes, and of course, that assumes that the source and destination are actually mounted on a NetApp filer, right? So there's no magic here. You can't, uh, you can't clone a file from a locally attached disk to a saying, we haven't figured that one out quite yet. But uh, we're working on it. Um, so, so what we're doing now is we are, um, uh, we are um, taking this drive and we are presenting it to all the members of the cluster. And so what happens next is we have to get the cluster to recognize the fact that this is available storage. So that's what's happening is we're making a WMI call here then script saying, hey, is this disk available yet for storage? And then when that occurs, now we can add it as, as a, a resource to the storage, uh, to the cluster, right? And that's what's happening now. And now what we can do is we can actually create VMs inside the cluster that refer to the, the VHDs that we created in the previous step, right? And so that's what you see the script doing now. It's going through and making VHDs, boom, uh, VMs, boom, 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 boom. And then when that, once that's done, then we can actually um, fire them up and start running. And that's what we're seeing here. So now we're adding them. And they're going to go through five, one, two, three, four, five. So I mean, the rest of this script, if you're not a PowerShell person, um, this might seem like super complicated. But the reality is, I think that if you're a Windows administrator and you spend full time doing Windows or Exchange or SharePoint like that, you're probably going to want to start spending some time with PowerShell if you haven't already. It just makes your life so much easier. I mean, I remember when I was first administering Windows 8, well, in the dark ages, we were using sticks and stuff, but that's a different story. Um, we, it was very painful, right? Because all these operations that were just repetitive. Um, and so now we see we have a running VM, and we're starting the VM up. And this, this is now the Windows setup experience, right? So for those of you that ever sysprepped a VM, this should look pretty familiar, right? This is a sysprep VM, and it's coming up, and you're doing a normal startup process. So that's the... Um, that's kind of the 10 second version of uh, rapid provisioning VMs. Uh, uh, there's a lot more detail there and there's a lot more technical how this works kind of stuff, but we'll get into that. If you want, I'm happy to chat with you after the session or come down to the booth and we'll walk you through it. And we have all the software um, running on our booth, so if you want to actually see it and touch it, you can do that. All right. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Exchange. Almost everything that I'm going to talk about applies to Microsoft applications, right? So whether it's a SQL, whether it's a SharePoint, we're focusing on Exchange because there's a couple of unique values that we have that really make Exchange compelling on NetApp. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how our storage efficiency enables large mailboxes. Everybody talks about large mailboxes. In the past, you know, what is your mailbox size? 200 megs, 500 megs. We want to go to a gig or two gigs. And most folks would take a couple of years to get there with their incoming mail, right? With Exchange 2010, now that they have this feature called an archive mailbox, which basically means you have another mailbox tied to your account, which post-service pack one can be placed in a different database. Most of the customers that I talk to say, we've got the last 10 years worth of PSTs on a file server that we're backing up to tape every night. They want to push that all in to the Exchange 2010 servers while they do the migration. And so they're not going from 500 meg to a gig. They're going from like 500 meg to 5 gig or 10 gig mailbox sizes. And so our efficiency story really helps deliver that 
where you're not having to buy hundreds or thousands of, of hard disk drives in order to, to uh, meet that need. Our storage infrastructure is very, very flexible, and, and we'll get into that. So, uh, Alex mentioned that you know, ONTAP is our operating system. It works on all the different controllers. Easy to upgrade controller heads, just doing a head swap, easy to add storage. A real key point with NetApp is our snapshots. Being able to take backups very, very quickly, very, very space efficiently in seconds to minutes instead of you know, a linear throughput uh, times the, divided by the size of the data where most folks are getting a couple hundred megs a second. And if they're having to back up a 10 terabyte exchange server, I mean, it just can't be done in a day. I'm also going to go over a little bit of our DR and our replication. Our replication product is called SnapMirror, and, and we'll talk about that. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some management. So we have a lot of management tools. Uh, Alex mentioned the PowerShell toolkit, which just really makes things easier. I mean, you can have a script in the same script that's installing Exchange, provisioning the storage, adding the databases. Uh, I mean, you're calling PowerShell commands that are touching the OS, that are touching Hyper-V, Exchange, and the storage. It, it, it's pretty compelling. So we really provide cost-effective data protection. What do, I need, what do I mean by that? Well, first, your data is protected, right? And it's protected by our fast implementation of RAID 6 that we call RAID DP. No one else runs RAID 6 because the performance is horrible. Our RAID DP performance is extremely fast. It's near RAID 10 performance. And you're going to consume a lot less disk. When you compare to like a RAID 10 deployment where you're having to double the number of disks and mirror everything, we've seen in a lot of deployments up to 46%. Because of the protection of RAID DP where you can lose up to two physical disk drives, and down here we have some numbers where some statisticians went through and calculated, you know, what's your probability in a five-year period to, to lose a disk array. As the disks get larger, the pr probability gets higher. So one of the things that we have with, with RAID DP is we don't have the right penalty. And so you're able to have incredible write performance with, without any sort of uh, write penalty. And so the key here is that if you take RAID DP where you can lose two physical disk drives and not impact your array, you take the fact that the controller can be clustered, and in 801 with cluster mode, you can have more than two controllers participating in that cluster. With your standard SAN, you know, multi-path, et cetera, most customers are able to deploy Exchange with fewer database copies. I mean, just going from three to two database copies in a single data center, I mean, that's a 33% disk savings off the top before we even turn on any optimizations. And, and we'll go into those in a few slides here. So these are our NetApp storage efficiencies, and we're going to dive into a lot of these a little bit deeper. The first one is deduplication. These percentages that you see up here are kind of averages over a bunch of different workloads. And we'll dive into exactly what you can expect to see on Exchange itself. But deduplication is where you're able to find duplicate blocks at the block level in the storage and update some pointers and recover that disk space. It's, it's like single instance storage on single instance storage happening at the controller level. Yeah, Quimby, and then it, just taking that same discussion on just another workload like, say, Hyper-V, right? right? As you can imagine, Hyper-V VHDs, they deduplicate very well, right? Uh, every VHD has a copy of Windows in it, so that, that goes right there. Right? If you have a fixed size VHD that has empty space in it, those zeros, they do really, really, really well. And in fact, we've seen, we, we have a statement out there that says that we guarantee 50% storage savings in a virtualized environment, straight up, um, or your money back. I don't think we've had to pay out on that one. No, no, no. I don't think so. so. And you have a lot of opportunity, right? It's like you can dedupe after, and then you also are talking about the, the flexible clones, right? Where you don't have to, you don't, you're not even deduplicating it at all. It's just right at the start, you're not costing any storage. Really, really compelling. Our thin provisioning, a lot of folks, when they thin provision, there's a lot of performance impact. There are problems with what can you do with that thin provisioned LUN if you need to copy that data to a different uh, disk group or aggregate. Um, it, it's very, very painful to do. Um, the way that NetApp thin provision storage is the same way we thick provision storage. Basically, as you write data, you write data into the volume. The thick provisioned LUNs will reserve a bunch of space into the volume so that 
you will be able to fill up that line because it's thickly provisioned, but the performance is the same. No performance impact within provisioning. In, in exchange environments, typically what we see is about a 20% disk savings. So any folks, any folks in the audience run exchange? Okay, so if any of you guys are familiar with, guys and gals are familiar with how Microsoft recommends that you size exchange, the first thing you do is you say, well, I'm gonna put so many users at a particular size of mailbox. Let's say 1,000 users and you wanna do two gig mailboxes, right? So not everybody's gonna be at that mailbox size, right? And so you're sizing for the quota. So there's a bunch of empty space there. And then you take uh, that the, the Microsoft size is gonna factor in 20% overhead above that in capacity. Then you're gonna add the content index there, calculate how much you need for logs, and then after you've done all that calculation, you say, well, the container that you put these files in, in addition to all that, has to have 20% free disk space. So it is very, very common to see folks that have deployed uh, per Microsoft guidance to look at the database line, and it's 50 to 70% free disk space. So one of our recommendations is to thin provision out that 20% free disk space out of the volume have a little bit of monitoring. I mean, just once a week, once a month. Maybe you're plugged into System Center, Operations Manager. You set some thresholds. We talked about uh, on command 3.0, and the, the savings are tremendous. Most customers are able to shave 35 to 55% of the disk space off of what you would size it out on Microsoft's spreadsheet. It, it's, it's phenomenal savings. I mentioned a lot about uh, RAID DP already. Uh, you know, it's significantly less disk than if you were to size it out with uh, you know, RAID 1, uh, RAID 10. And so if you ever pull up the Microsoft sizer, it will dump out and it will show you, well, for RAID 5, you need this many disks for capacity versus performance. And it will do the same thing with the different parity. And uh, RAID 5 is almost all, always less disk. For snapshot copies, the key here is that when we take a snapshot, nothing happens. Basically, we're saying all the blocks, all the, all the written blocks that are exposed to the live file system, all those blocks now are part of this snapshot. Well, when we go to change a block, we never change it. We write a new block and update that to the live file system. So no work was done on the snapshot. So that's why we can have hundreds of snapshots and not have a performance impact. A lot of other ways that you can do a snapshot is called a copy on write. And basically what happens is when you decide to change a block, you have to copy that into the snapshot space and then you write the new one. So you can imagine that as you have more and more snapshots, the performance just gets worse and worse and worse. It's logarithmic. And so most folks that uh, consider snapshots to be bad, you almost need to clone everything and copy everything because of the performance impact. Well, on NetApp, there's no performance impact. And there's huge space efficiency. For thin replication, the idea here is that if you have two storage controllers and you're going to replicate data across, you took a snapshot, you want to replicate that data so that at the DR site, you're up to date, you're, you're just copying the changed blocks. And so you're not moving everything. And for folks that have real cost sensitivities on you know, your bandwidth, and we get this a lot uh, outside of the United States, you can even turn on compression on the snap mirror. And finally, Alex did a great job explaining FlexClone. And so not only is that at the VM level, but I mean, a lot of folks use this as exchange in like a test dev environment. If anybody's ever applied a service pack or a hotfix or a rollup and had it take out part of the exchange infrastructure, you know how painful that can be. And so to be able to FlexClone your environment, present that exchange infrastructure as a virtual machine off the network, apply all the service packs and make sure, well, we didn't break OA, Outlook, Mappy, everything's okay. Okay, let's go ahead and put this in production. Well, the only space that that took was the space of actually adding those hotfixes, and then you're done with it, you throw it away, and uh, it's all gone. So I mentioned snapshots, and we have storage-efficient backups. I explained how that worked. But the, the method that I want to talk here is that a lot of customers that I'm talking to are on Exchange 2003. And back in Exchange 2003, typically you did a streaming online backup. And a lot of folks still use tape. It, does anybody in the audience, do, anybody still using tape? Or is there, still using tape, okay. So the target is irrelevant, whether it's tape or disk. The point that I'm trying to make is that if you have a bunch of machines and you're physical, 
And in an exchange environment, typically your backup window, you'd want to schedule that at an off hour, and you'd want to make that backup as fast as you could. So if you were doing a streaming online backup, the rate or the throughput, how many megabytes per second can I get to the tape device? How many megabytes per second can I get to the disk over here? That's your bottleneck, right? And so if you were gigabit uh, ethernet, right, and you didn't have any sort of round robining or, or uh, uh, any way to combine multiple NICs, you're basically wire speed at 100 megabytes a second. So if you had like a, a four hour backup window, 100 megabytes a second, I mean, that you're basically talking about a couple of uh, 100 gigabytes, right, to meet that backup window. So if that server had a couple of thousand gigabytes, you wouldn't be able to meet that backup window. Now you go and take all these different servers and you do a consolidation from physical to virtual, and now suddenly you might have 5, 10, 20 of your old physical servers on a single hypervisor, on, on one node in your Hyper-V cluster. And being able to push now 10 or 20 fold that 100 or 200 megabytes a second out of a single physical server isn't feasible. It's almost not possible. And so one of the things that we really recommend is snapshot that data. Don't move it all off every single time you take a backup. And so if you're able to take a snapshot, the snapshot occurs in seconds to minutes, and you're able to have lots and lots of snapshots. Now, one of the things that's really storage efficient about this backup is I mentioned how taking the snapshot, nothing happens. It's when you add new blocks because you've changed things, then you orphan or keep these old blocks that are in the snapshot, and that starts to accumulate space. In the exchange world, typically, you'd see maybe a 2%, maybe a 3% daily change rate. Now, any number I throw out, I, we can design a corner case where the number would be a lot smaller or a lot larger, right? You're going to have a lot different daily change rate if you have 100 messages a day coming in, but you have 50 meg mailboxes, right? Versus if you had a 5 gig mailbox. The daily change rate um, is a metric of the mail coming in and the online maintenance is occurring. And so being able to just have you know, a tiny bit of, of storage consumed for that snapshot, you could contrast that with other VSS backup mechanisms where you have to copy everything off disk. You have to copy it to maybe a, a backup server. Maybe it's using VSS, so it's only copying the change blocks over the wire, but what you'll find is when you go through the sizing guidance there is that typically you'll be three to five X the data set size. So you're backing up a one terabyte database, you're gonna need three to five terabytes on that backup server. Even though you're doing VSS, Versus with NetApp, it would be the daily change rate. So if you needed a week, and, you, and let's say you had a 2% daily change rate, it would be 14% of the data set size. And so that's, that's, that's just an incredible efficiency story. The last thing on here is about CPU, right? Backup applications typically, maybe it's running 20, 30% CPU, and now you've got 20 VMs on one hypervisor, you're consuming a lot of CPU, and a lot of folks have been forced uh, who have been forced to stick with tape have been forced to limit the number of VMs that they can put on a particular hypervisor uh, at any one time just so that they can get the throughput out of the server. Now when I fo focus on an application, whether it's Exchange, SharePoint, or SQL, we have a Snap Manager product that will help take that snapshot. And why that's so key and important is because you need the backup application or in the VSS framework speak, oh, the requester, to be able to talk to the writer, Active Directory has a writer, Exchange has a writer, SQL has a writer, so that you can quest all the I.O. so that when you take the snapshot, it's clean. You don't have a hot split. You don't have anything corrupted. So you take that snapshot, and the, 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 the key there is that it's going to take a couple of seconds. And if you take 100 snapshots a day or one snapshot a day, the space is the same, right? It's just the changed blocks. So if you have a 2% daily change rate, but you decide to take a snapshot only at midnight every night, you will consume the same amount of space and have to size for that 14% if you had a 2% daily change rate for a week as if you took 100 snapshots. And so the key when you're, the metric that you want to use is how long am I keeping the snapshots online, not how many. And so this really helps with a change in Exchange 2010, for instance, Prior versions of Exchange and Exchange 2010 where you don't have a DAG or a database availability group. And I want to dive in that, in, into DAG a little bit because I've got a really neat demo that I'm going to show you about how you never have to go through the pain of reseeding the database through the network, again, if you're on NetApp. And, and, and the key there is, is, and I just lost my train of thought. The key there is when you're taking all of these backups, um, 
it's not going to take a lot of space. So most folks decide, OK, I need to meet my customer SLA of, say, a week's worth of backups. And if they have three copies or four copies of a particular database spread across a couple of data centers, they're typically going to only back up for that one week or two weeks on one copy of, of, the, of the DAG. And then on every other copy of that same database, you just keep like a half day or a one day rolling backup so that you would never have to reseed. And, and we'll go into that. Some of the other support that we have in here uh, in, for reference is we support the DAG. So if you're migrating to NetApp and you have a DAG already, it will migrate all the copies of the database on all the nodes in the DAG to the NetApp storage simultaneously. Um, it makes migration really, really easy. Uh, for folks that uh, are going to uh, use Move User, that, that's another option. Um, the final thing I want to talk to you about on this slide is we have a plugin for our Snap Manager for Exchange. It's a product called uh, Single Mailbox Recovery. And the key to this product is if you have deleted a piece of mail and it's outside of the tombstone, but maybe your customer SLA is you're going to keep you know, 30 days or, or 60 days worth of backups, a lot of folks will snap bolt that off to a small controller with, a, with just a bunch of really large drives because it's just doing sequential reads. And if you needed to recover that data, it can be a painful process if you had, say, a lagged copy of the database or if you had to pull it off disk somewhere else. With single mailbox recovery, you could have a bunch of snapshots of that data, pull queries, recover that mail, put it in your inbox, put it in somebody else's inbox, put it in a PST, and then when you're done, it will clean up all those snapshots. So SMBR is, is really, really cool. Now what we're going to do is a DAG reseed demo. So the key here is we're going to have a database that is in two different locations, and we're mounted and active in Seattle. And then what we're going to do is our Tacoma site. Sorry. Our Tacoma site is the, the, the other site. So let, let's play this, and, and I'll explain what's, what's happening. What I'm going to do is we're going to first fail the database that's in Tacoma. And so what I've done here is you see that we've got a Tacoma database on top, and it's mounted. So everybody's online with their clients, you know, whether it's OA or their phone or Outlook. You're, you're getting your mail. Everything's happy. What we're going to do here is we're going to suspend the database in Tacoma. So after we suspend the database in Tacoma, I'm going to Alt-Tab into a controller here. And, and we look here, and we see that there's the Exchange database. We're going to go ahead and delete it. Then we're going to Alt-Tab over to some of the log files and be malicious and uh, delete a couple of log files. There we're deleting log 18. Here we're going to delete another log file. So now that we've deleted these files, we're going to go ahead and resume the Tacoma copy. And so what you see here is the Tacoma copy is failed. So this is where you would normally come in. You get some alert from System Center Operations Manager. And in this case, we have database one with two copies, right? But you might have hundreds of databases across a dozen servers. And you know, database you know, 72 on DAG node 4 has failed. So you get this alert, and you want to fix it. But you don't want to copy that one or two terabyte data, database across the network, because you're only getting 200 megs a second, maybe 300 megs a second. Or maybe you're getting uh, you know, 10 megs a second across the WAN. So now what we're going to do is we're going to kick off a script that's going to fix it. So what we're going to do, the first, since it's failed there in Tacoma, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to suspend it, because it's not failed and suspended. After we suspend it, we're going to go ahead and remove the copy that's in Tacoma. After we remove it, and you see that it's removed down there, we're going to immediately add it back, seating postponed. Now the key here is that we're adding it back and we're saying seating postponed. So that, if you don't put seeding postponed, what's going to happen is it's going to immediately start copying the database from Seattle to Tacoma. And, and we don't want to do that. So now Exchange is sitting there patiently ignoring the Tacoma copy of the database. And we are now restoring the database line. So we've kicked that off. Now this is in real time. I didn't, this video, we didn't scrunch the time. And I can show this to you live in our booth uh, in 1001. So we completed the database line. And now we're starting to run. Uh, the restore on the transaction log line. It's going to finish in a few seconds. And then what we're going to do is we're going to kick it off. We're going to uh, go ahead and say, resume the Tacoma database. And it's going to start resynchronizing. So here we go. We're starting to resynchronize. You see that it's initializing. And it, it's asking for 35 log files. So what we see down here is it's saying we've got two columns. On the left is the copy queue length, and on the right is the replay. So it's saying, since that last backup that you took an hour ago, uh, this database has generated 35 new log files. So it's going to have to copy 35 one megabyte files to be happy 
replay them into the database in Tacoma versus if this was a two terabyte database, you'd also have been copying that database. Now that we've finished, I'm going to call uh, the, the, the uh, get uh, database copy status there, and you see that replay queue is fine, everything's fine. Now we're going to go back to our mount point. We see that the database is back. We'll switch to the logs. We'll see that log 18 is back. And so what we're really excited about with this demo is with on command, we're going to be able to query dynamically, okay, it was database 70 on this server. We know the server name. We know the database. Then we're going to query, where is that database mounted on this mount point or this drive letter? We'll be able to, with workflow in El Palace, have it pop up and say, hey, this database is having a problem. So then you could click it and it could dynamically create this script to fix this. And so you wouldn't, if you have a large environment, you wouldn't have to have a custom script for every single database. So now I want to talk a little bit about deduplication and deduplication with Exchange. We mentioned a little bit about how huge of a win deduplication is on virtual machines, your application and your operating system bits. But now I want to talk to how it really applies to Exchange. In the bottom right, you see a couple of percentages for different types of application, different type of media. On the left bottom here, you see what's happening is we're identifying blocks that are identical and then removing them and updating some pointers. As a new block comes in, we look at this hash and compare it to a table, and if it matches, then we'll flag that block for the next time deduplication is run. And then you'll do a bit-by-bit -bit comparison for that 4K block, and if so, we'll remove it, update pointers. We're the only storage vendor that runs deduplication on the primary and secondary and archival storage. We're really proud of our deduplication performance. Uh, we have an enormous amount of users that are running with deduplication, and it comes in the box. It ships with the controller. And when we talk about that 50% or more capacity, we have uh, the guarantee that Alex talked about. If you're moving from a physical to a virtual environment, you're going to have enormous savings. Now with Exchange, what did we get for Exchange? In the past, with Exchange 2003 or 2007, we typically saw 2 or 3% on deduplication rates. So that's not compelling enough to, to really bother with. With Exchange 2010, there's a huge change. Single instance storage is gone. The, scheme, the schema's uh, collapsed. Uh, attachments aren't compressed. And so what we recommend in our best practice guide, it, in, because of what we've seen at customer sites, is between 15 and 35%. And every single person who stopped by my booth has said in the mid to upper 20s of what they're getting right now today. And so what will you get? Well, it depends. Are, are you like an ISP where every, all the mail sent, sent in and out of the organization, nothing's sent in between to other folks, and there's no attachments? Or are you like you know, a, a, a office work type where you're sending lots of uh, office attachments? You're going to see incredible deduplication rates. So now I want to talk a little bit about flash cache. And to finish with the last slide, if we go in and reduce the amount of capacity that you need because of all of our storage efficiency, if you're very high on the capacity side, let's say you're using one or two terabyte physical disk drives, but you're having five or ten gigabyte or gigabyte mailboxes, when you go and deploy that, you might have 10 or 20x the IOPS that you need to support that exchange. And so if we shrink your capacity requirement by a third or half, you have so many IOPS to spare, it doesn't matter. But it's possible to come up with a design where maybe you have two times the IOPS that you need, or 50% the IOPS that you need. And if we shrink your capacity requirement an enormous amount, then you're going to have to add physical disk drives because you need the IOPS. And so one of the tools that we have to fight that is our flash cache. We used to call it a PAM, or a performance accelerator acceleration module. What the flash cache does is it's a one quarter to one half terabyte PCI Express card. In some of our controllers, you can put more than one of them in the controller. And so when you have that in flash, you can have blocks that you're touching a lot. And typically blocks that are hot, that, are the, that have been deduplicated, are touched more often, right? So if 50 folks in this room get the same email attachment and it gets deduplicated down to one copy on disk, as every person opens it, after the first person's opened it, it's in flash. And so you're going to get 
memory speed or flash speed? And if you think about that in a virtualization setting, so let's say you had oh, 200 yeah. VMs that have all been deduped down and all the, the, uh, the Windows files, the boot files, and the, and the VHDs all deduplicated down to zero, and now you want to start all the VMs in your cluster all at once, right, because you took an outage or something. And a traditional storage platform, that would cause a, what's referred to as a boot storm, right? You'd have thrashing on disk. Everybody's trying to get their boot lines all, all at the same time. Um, for us, what happens is the first one in causes those lungs, those blocks to populate into Flash. Everybody else gets them from Flash. So it's extremely efficient. Um, so it, it, the reason why we talk about this together is if you're doing uh, highly optimized storage systems where you're deduplicating and you're thin provisioning, you're basically re reusing the same blocks over and over and over and over and over again, you want to make sure you have a good caching strategy, especially with the advent of larger and larger and larger disks. Right? We're not getting more IOPS per spindle, but the spindles themselves are getting much larger. So you have this weird thing where you have plenty of capacity now, but you know, you're, you're becoming IOPS starved very quickly. So our message is spindles for capacity, flash for IOPS. Why use flash for capacity? It makes no sense, right? The cost per gigabyte is, is way out of bounds compared to SATA disk, for example. But the IOPS you get per dollar, it's just the opposite, right? Flash is much cheaper for an IOP to buy than to buy more spindles. So by combining these two things together, you're basically getting the best of both worlds. So it's all about balancing the IOPS load requested from the workload with the capacity load by using both of these technologies together, right? Really what you're getting is you're getting this automatic storage tiering built right into a single controller. Definitely. And to dive a little bit in more detail about the flash cache. So here, here's a little uh, diagram showing on the left, we've got your typical storage controller. So if a read request comes in, I need block A, it's going to check memory. And if it's in memory, boom. Sends the block, you're done. If it's not in memory, it's going to have to go to the physical disk shelf. And the physical disk shelf is many orders of magnitude slower than in memory, right? When you add the flash cache card, it, after it checks memory, if it's not there, it will check flash. And if it's in flash, it will serve that block from the flash cache. Now, you can see on the right the relative latency, right? For Exchange, for instance, you really need to design for sub-20 millisecond latency. And so if the bar there is in milliseconds and we're higher than 10 milliseconds for disk, we see that we're sub one millisecond for flash cache, and we're even s faster with the CPU on the controller. So now I just wanted to show a quick screenshot on our management pack uh, for System Center Operations Manager, what today is Appliance Watch, and what in a couple of uh, weeks is going to be on command 3.0. So basically, this is System Center Operations Manager, and you see that it's got the data on tap, which is our operating system, storage systems, and here's a couple of alerts. So some alerts pop up, and so the alert's just text-based. So what you can do is you can drill down and figure out, well, what was that alert? Here's more of a logical view. Did it involve this controller or this enclosure? Maybe a power supply was bumped by somebody in the, in the lab, or a power supply has failed. Or on the right, you have a logical view of how we expose storage. So the first one is the disk grouping, which we call an aggregate. And below that is the, is the logical volume. And below that is the LUNs themselves. And so if you resolve the issue, then you can continue. Maybe, maybe you need to drill down and see, well, what is that issue? Is it a performance-related issue? You know, and in this case, this is you know, some data written. You can look at, well, how did I connect to the storage? And since we have unified storage where you can connect it with fiber channel over ethernet, fiber channel, iSCSI, maybe networking protocols, NFS, SIFs, you can by protocol look at that, maybe look at particular volumes and even drill down to particular LUNs. One of the things that we find with folks that are deploying Exchange in smaller environments, let's say you have less than 2,000 users in the environment, is typically they're not just deploying Exchange on NetApp, they're deploying Exchange, they're deploying SharePoint SQL, maybe if they're moving to virtualization, all the VMs are there, maybe they're booting from SAN on their hypervisors, Hyper-V or ESX. So what you can do is, in some cases, you might want to separate Exchange into different aggregates, and in some of those really small cases, maybe you only have a dozen or two dozen physical disk drives. What folks will do is turn on some of the QoS on the Exchange lens to ensure that the performance is there for Exchange. And then after you've resolved the issue, you go back and look and see, you know, if you pop up each one of these, you would resolve it, right, after you've actually fixed the problem. So now I want to really quickly talk about how we protect the data in a Hyper-V environment. So what's really neat about this is, is you have your Hyper-V cluster, 
and maybe you're running Exchange on that, other applications, and you want to have DR. And for whatever reason, you don't want to stretch the DAG. Maybe you have a recovery point objective that you have to meet. With Exchange, it's very difficult to meet a recovery point objective, right? Because basically what's happened is you're log shipping now with DAG and, and with CCR back in Exchange 2007. So you might be missing X number of logs. And if you're up to date, maybe you're just missing the current one, but maybe you're missing a couple of them. Well, you might come back and say, well, the logs are only a meg in size, so if I've lost two log files, each database has only lost two megabytes. Well, the problem is you could have a lot of long-running transactions. Alex could have just maybe lost nothing. This gentleman over here might have just lost the last message that came 30 seconds ago. I might have lost a message that I received a long time ago, but because it had a very large attachment in it and it had to get rolled back, I've lost that. Now, in the case of, of uh, DR, right, on the left we have the primary site, on the right we have the DR site. Typically with log shipping, if you're log shipping across and the primary site goes down, you could potentially lose a lot of data. Now, what some folks would choose to do is they'll choose to take the hub transport servers, which are the ones that are running SMTP for the org, and boot them from SAN and maybe sequ sequentially replicate them to the DR site. What we recommend doing is just replicating out all of it. We have some customers that don't like the statelessness of Exchange, where, yeah, if the CAS Server 1 dies and you bring up CAS Server 3 and join it to the CAS array, it's ready to go. I mean, you didn't need CAS Server 1. But there are some customers that are like, if the primary site goes down, the guy who's going to bring it up on the DR site after the VP says, fail over, start it up, may not be an expert at, on Hyper-V and may not be an Exchange expert and needs it to just work. Or, database portability that exists in Exchange where you bring the same database up with a different server name, maybe you have old clients. And so they don't understand things like auto-discover, so they can't get to the server. And so in this environment, and this is actually something that we demoed last year on TechEd Live, we failed over from one site to the other. And so you, you've got either your planned migration, you know, the, the hurricane season's here and it's coming to, to the area, so we're going to fail over to the DR site. So we would run a PowerShell script, export the hyper export the Hyper-V VMs from uh, uh, ex uh, the, the hype, export the VMs from the Hyper-V cluster, re-import them on the DR site. If you completely lost the primary site, the same script would run. It would break the mirror and bring it all up. And we did it in just a couple of minutes. Next, um, that this I want to talk about is that we're using Snap Manager for Hyper-V, which is a Snap Manager product that is what is taking the snapshot of those VMs. Yeah, so in, in uh, on command 3.0, what we've done is we've automated this process. So there's a discovery agent that can run in advance. So every day or every hour, you run this discovery agent, you query WMI, you say, okay, what's the configuration of my cluster? Okay, I have six VMs in that cluster, and they're configured in this manner, and they have these kinds of NICs, and here's their GUIDs, and all that kind of stuff. We take that information, we copy it to the, to the DR site. Then if you have a failover, when it comes time to restore, you take what basically is an XML file, because that's what that tool produces, and you play that back into our recovery wizard. And what it does is it recreates the primary site's cluster all the way down to the individual NICs and their MAC addresses and every, every, everything about the, the VMs that were on the primary site are now replicated into the secondary site. So when you bring your Windows machines up, you don't have to do strange things like all of a sudden tell them what they're, that they have NICs and their IPs are different, right? Because you create a right. new VM, Right? It perceives that's actually a different machine, right? So now you get local, you know, local area network 16 because it's a different NIC. And, you know, so we don't have any of that problems because we're actually, it's very similar to if you manually exported the, the, the VM and then took that file to another server and imported it. So it's the same concept, but we're just doing it in an automated fashion. That way when you bring the foreign side up, you don't have to worry about how do I recreate the VMs, how much memory do they have, how many NICs, what VLANs are they on? That all just comes with. So that's new in the uh, on-command uh, 3.0 product. Um, and again, would encourage you to come down and take a look at it. It's, it's actually pretty cool. And, and we have a lot of customers that, because of their networking uh, issues and things of that nature, um, our, the latency will not allow them to stretch the DAG in the Exchange 2010. And so what you're, in those situations, they're going to use SnapMirror to take care of that replication to the DR site. Other, other reasons that you would consider it is basically when you're talking about the customer service level agreement, if they have a hard recovery point objective that they need to meet, and they need to be able to meet a five minute, a 10 minute recovery point objective. 
How it works in Exchange typically is you're going to take a snapshot of the database and you take that backup. And let's say you want to take that every 30 minutes or every hour or every 15 minutes. And then the other thing you can do is you can take a frequent recovery point, which is basically just a snapshot of the logs. Very, very tight intervals, maybe every 10, every five minutes. And so then you would have that guaranteed recovery point objective if that is a requirement for your customers or for you. So we're a real complete virtualization solution for Hyper-V and for other hypervisors. And so when you, when you tie Hyper-V with you know, R2 and with System Center, we're really going to lower the costs. How we're going to lower their costs is by being really, really efficient. And so you're going to really have a win on your acquisition cost. When it really starts to get crazy is when you factor in backing up on NetApp versus the, the, the competition or versus tape, and you're going to have huge savings there. And then there's the total cost of ownership that's involved with that. If you're able to, to you know, reduce the number of disks by 30%, then there's the rack, the cooling, the rack space, the power, uh, and the total cost of ownership is just really, really compelling. Uh, flexibility and the rapid uh, provisioning, we kind of talked about that, and that's really awesome for the folks that have to actually go in and deploy this. To be able to have it repeatable in scripts is just uh, a real ease. Our improved management, uh, we've got uh, tools that come with the controller that you can log to databases for historical information, for performance, things of that nature to help you to trend the, the space utilization and what's the ramp up. Are we increasing by 2% a month or 10% a month? So when you're thin provisioning, you can decide, okay, in about six months, we're going to need to add a couple more disks to this aggregate. And you can do that. Maybe you need to grow your volume. Maybe you need to grow the LUN in Windows. For our business continuity, I mean, the, the key here is, you know, like we just showed on the last slide, where you can use replication to help you be up on the other side. Within the data center, if you're using DAG with Exchange 2010, for example, if a physical server goes down, then the database will activate on a different server, another copy of that database. All of this is for having really, really small RPOs, right? Five, ten minutes. Um, if you need zero RPO, you know, we have a product uh, that can do that. I mean, you're going to need dark fiber. Typically, you've got you know, 100 kilometers. We call that metro cluster, and we've got a cluster DLL for that. And so if anybody has questions about that, come see me in the booth. But all this virtualization value is applicable to SQL, SharePoint, Exchange. Uh, I mean, we're really tightly integrated with Microsoft products. So this is my last slide on Exchange. Why should you choose NetApp for Exchange? Why is NetApp the best solution for Exchange? You should be able to use fewer DAG copies. That's less complexity. That's less servers to manage. That's less database objects to manage. Anybody who's ever had to deploy Exchange 2010 DAG, once you get more than about 20 databases per server, and that's not very uncommon, because typically folks will decide that they want active databases in the data center, passive databases in the data center, and then passive databases maybe from another data center. And so if you had 20 active databases, you typically will have 50 or 60 total databases on a single server. And if you've ever been in that point, I mean, just rebooting and having things glitch a little bit and having to do a bunch of reseeds is very, very painful. I was talking with Microsoft on the floor, and they, they're working on some customers where they're going from here to APAC. And they've had to seed, reseed, in the two to 500 gig range, like 1,600 databases. And it took them like three weeks. And so it's really, really, really painful. And if you're using NetApp, you're not going to go through that reseed problem. Our storage capacity scales really, really easily. I talked about how you can grow everything on the fly without any outages. Uh, deduplication is really going to increase your efficiency. And if you have turned on deduplication and you have Exchange on NetApp, I'm really interested in what percent deduplication rates you've been getting. So come see me. Uh, the automated backups, being able to schedule this, being able to run this all from PowerShell. You know, Snap Manager for Exchange has a GUI app, but we also have it in PowerShell. Most folks are going to, if you have 60 databases on a server and you have six of them in the DAG, uh, you know, for 360 databases, you don't want to go through to create a schedule for each one in a job. You want to know server name is server one, DB1 through DB60, and you just want to cut and paste and make your scripts really quick, really easy. Uh, don't take you know, three or four days just to set this up. Backup and recoveries in minutes, seconds to minutes. It's not going to be hours or days. And keep in mind that since it's a snapshot technology, it's 
the, the da data set size is irrelevant, right? So it's going to be very, very fast whether it's a 5 meg database or whether it's a 2T database. And our Hyper-V virtualization solution, we, have, we mentioned the support for System Center Operations Manager. We have the support for VMM, SSP. Alex talked a lot about Opalis. And then we're really excited about our PowerShell scripts. Being able to do that all from PowerShell, where you're doing and talking to multiple server and applications and the storage all in the same script is so powerful, rather than having to do it all from a CLI. So we really deliver great value at an attractive TCO. And Alex, do you want to talk about the related yeah, so, content? Yeah, uh, so there's been some uh, sessions we've done earlier in the week, and I apologize. Virtualization 201 and uh, Virtualization 327 have already occurred. Um, but if you go up to the uh, um, uh, tech ad online, you can grab those sessions and listen to them recorded. In those sessions, we go through a lot of detail on our fast track submission and some of the things we're doing on the virtualization side. Um, we are going to go downstairs next I'm with Adam Hall and SIM 335, and we'll, we'll talk about the Opalis integration components. If you want to see that, that's where I'm headed next. It's in about a half an hour. Um, and then, of course, find us in our booth and find us uh, online. Um, so uh, and if you just want to grab us after the session, we're more than happy to answer your questions or get into details. Here's some resources that uh, Microsoft has provided. And of course, please fill out an evaluation. Uh, they uh, have a bunch of different uh, items that are going to be uh, rewards for uh, filling out the, val the evaluation. So do that. And then finally. Yep, you can just, if you want, you can just scan this tag, and it'll take you right to the evaluation session. Great. So thank you all uh, very much for your attention. Much appreciated. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them at this time. Thank you. Thank you.